Welcome to this presentation of Santa Barbara, land of inspiration, innovation, and ingenuity through vintage postcards and photographs. My name is George Sampanis, and I will be your host as we open a window into Santa Barbara, an incubator of new business ventures. I have always been fascinated by the number of worldwide companies founded in our little city. This fascination led me and my wife's suggestion to prepare this set of presentations. Our featured company in part one was the Lockheed Corporation, while this presentation, part two, will cover Sambo's Restaurants and Motel 6. Many of you are familiar with and may have eaten at Sambo's on Cabrillo Boulevard. The original pancake restaurant grew into a giant across America with 1,200 restaurants, 60,000 employees, and sales exceeding 400 million then year dollars. Paraphrasing the Daily Beast website, the story of Sambo's is one of the most incredible in the history of American restauranteering. It's got everything. Bootstrap business acumen, meteoric success, sudden catastrophic failure, a late stage family revival, and a king size racial controversy to top it all off. Well, it all began right here in Santa Barbara. Two Santa Barbara men, Sam Battistone Sr. and F. Newell Bonnet, opened the first Sambo's restaurant on June 17, 1957. They picked a location across from the beach at 216 West Cabrillo Boulevard, Santa Barbara. The two partners had come from very different backgrounds. Sam was born in Santo Stefano de Sassanio, Italy in 1912. When he was seven years old, he and his mother left Italy to join his father, who was working in the coal mines near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. After graduating from high school, Sam found work laboring in the same coal mines as his father. Dreaming of a future out west, he eventually found his way to California. Eventually, he made his way to Glendale, California, where he was employed as a cook at the Blue Bell Cafe. It was here he met Ione Isabel Jensen, a waitress at the restaurant. They married and started a family rearing three children, Sam Battistone Jr., Donna Kirby, and John Roger Battistone. In 1947, Sam and his family moved to Santa Barbara, where in the early 1950s, they opened up Sammy's Grill at 511 State Street. F. Newell Bonnet, Bo, was the great grandson of a pioneer who came to California as a gold miner in 1848. His grandparents were a founding family of Santa Clara County. His father, Floyd, was a contractor and an excellent engineer who built bridges and highways all over California. In the late 1930s, retiring from the construction industry, the Bonnet family moved from Campbell, California to Santa Barbara. The Bonnet family settled in and in the 1950s, Floyd became a city council member and then mayor of Santa Barbara. Bonnet Park, located in the west side, is named in his honor. His son Newell, or Bo as he became known, 
enlisted in the service where he became a pilot. Bo piloted a fighter airplane during World War II and the Korean War where he was shot down and rescued at sea. His rescuers, upon pulling him from the freezing cold water, said, Smile, you're on candid camera. A story he would recall often, followed by, I've never been so damn happy to see someone in my life. After the war, Bo returned to California, where he met his wife, Nada. They moved to Santa Barbara with Bo working in the Barnett shop, a family cabinet business. Then he went into sales, selling restaurant equipment. This provided the opportunity for the fortuitous friendship with Sam that would last for decades. They discussed the possibilities of opening a restaurant. Since the story had such a profound impact on the business, especially in later years, I will briefly try to summarize the plot. The story takes place in India, where the author spent over 30 years of her life. It tells the story of a little boy who, while walking through the jungle in South India with his umbrella and fancy clothes, is confronted by a hungry tiger that wants to eat him. To avoid being eaten, Sambo suggests he would give him his beautiful red coat. Sambo is approached by another tiger intent on eating him. He talks the tiger out of this by offering the beast his blue pants. A third tiger approaches threatening to eat Sambo who offers this beast his shoes. The tiger responds that he has four feet and what can he do with just two shoes? Sambo suggests putting one on each ear, which pleases the tiger. The situation repeats and Sambo gives up his umbrella. Each tiger paraded around thinking themselves to be the grandest tiger in the jungle. Jealousy set in and they started fighting and throwing off their clothes. Next, they neared a tree and each tiger began biting the tail of the other. Round and round they went, faster and faster and faster, churning until there was nothing left but a pool of melted butter. His father, Black Jumbo, comes upon the scene, gathers the butter, and brings it home to Black Mumba, his mom. His mom then makes stacks and stacks of pancakes with lots of tasty melted butter. So when people saw the name Sambo, they thought of pancakes, which is why it was such a good name for a place that served them. Or at least it was when the first Sambo's was opened in 1957. The partners figured they'd serve sizzling pancakes, offer coffee for 10 cents a cup at a time when coffee routinely went for a quarter, and to give their customers service with a smile. They advertised and offered a bottomless 10 cent cup of coffee and would refill your cup all day long on that dime. Bottomless. Sam's slogan, what the country needs is a good 10 cent cup of coffee, became a reality. The men prided themselves on the warm atmosphere and decoration at their flagship restaurant. Its design was bright and cheerful with soft and soothing music playing in the background. Sam cooked on one grill while Sam Jr. manned another as Ione waited on the tables. It was the Battistone family serving their va valued family customers a choice of 21 different pancakes and a few other offerings 
to keep the 45 counter and booth seats full. The good vibes also extended between the partners, with Bonnet years later stating, Next to my marriage, my association with Sam Battistone Sr. was one of the most pleasurable and gratifying associations that I have ever experienced. All was well. The dining on pancakes floating in rare maple or boysenberry syrup dripping with golden tiger butter led to growth and grow they did. Business boomed and they grew rapidly, faster than anyone could have imagined possible. After just one year in business, they opened a second location in Sacramento. Four more California stores followed in 1959, and by late 1963, there were 20 Sambos on the West Coast, including three in Oregon, one in Seattle, and one in Reno, Nevada. Each of the restaurants was a success, averaging $300,000 in sales per year. That's a whole bunch of pancakes and coffee. Part of their success was economic. Sambo's didn't raise the price of a single menu item during its first six years. But another reason was advertising. Heavy promotions sparked new restaurants, which were strategically located off main highways. Sambo's logo was emphasized on high billboards and in every conceivable spot, ranging from coat hangers to executive planes. A kids club, Sambo's Tiger Tamers, later called the Tiger Club, promoted the chain's family image. Effective advertising helped boost sales and make Sambo's a household name. There is a place I love to go when Sambo's is its name. Oh, it's got good things to eat to know when Sambo's is its name. Oh, S-A-M-B-O's, S-A-M-B-O's, and Sambo's is its name. Oh. If you're 12 or under, you can join Sambo's Tiger Club. You get a free tiger mask when you sign up. A birthday certificate will be mailed to you for a free brownie, a dollar's worth of food, and your choice of one gift. Hand puppets, t-shirt iron on, or color and book. But you must be accompanied by an adult. S-A-M-B-O's, and Sambo's is its name. Oh. A major factor in the company's fantastic growth was an innovative promotion that store managers were entitled to 20% of the profit from their stores, an innovative equity sharing scheme that rewarded restaurant managers with a piece of the pie. The concept that Sam and Bo developed and coined as a fraction of the action was revolutionary. At that time, the restaurant industry treated its workers like machinery and expendable objects bought at the lowest possible cost. Managers at other restaurants were not allowed to use their own judgment. The fraction of the action rewarded managers and incentivized them. Turnover was drastically reduced to almost zero. Lower level workers worked harder, aspiring to become managers as opportunities were provided by the incredible expansion. The program resulted in a better store level performance and a significantly lower overhead as recruiting training and supervisory expenses were less than the competition. In 1967, Sam and Newell both decided to retire from active management and Sam Jr., age 27, was the natural successor. He was determined 
to take Sambo's to a higher level. Sam Jr. was well-schooled in the restaurant business when he took over the company, but he had a much more aggressive approach to expansion than did his father. Two years later, in 1969, the chain went public, selling 515,000 shares. At that time, they had 92 restaurants, 2,500 employees with units in 12 states. Sambo's had become a giant tiger indeed. That year, Sambo's opened their 100th store in Goleta with Roger Battistone, age 25, its owner manager. In this photograph, a proud Sam Battistone is shown with his two sons at the milestone celebration opening. Between 1970 and 1974, the stock price soared with shares splitting five times. Here in Santa Barbara, Sambo's had become a major presence. By 1974, Sambo's had a training center and warehouse in Carpinteria. It also housed their meat production plant and distribution center and a luxurious corporate office building on Upper State Street. They had become one of the largest employers in Santa Barbara County. From 92 locations in 1969, the number nearly tripled by 1972 and then nearly tripled again by 1976 to 712 locations. This graph visibly displays their phenomenal growth. The restaurants promoted and profited from an array of merchandise sold at each restaurant's cashier stand, including plush tiger dolls and masks and coloring books were provided to every child. Wooden nickels, coffee mugs, thermos bottles, and more were offered. This commercial is just for kids, so parents, please leave the room. Okay. You know what it is when your parents take you to a restaurant that's only grown-up food? You'd rather have your own menu at Sambo's, hot dogs, hamburgers. But the trick is, how do you get them there? Film Sambo's has a new menu just for them. Just the 712 stores in 1976 were raking in $380 million a year, the equivalent of over $1.6 billion today. The company expanded its menu and by 1977, the chain had become the largest full-service restaurant in the country. Yes, the largest in the United States. At the corporate level, Sam Jr. was at the helm running the $400 million company. Sambo's had become a growing part of the American landscape an American icon on its highways, byways, and her cities, large and small. In the mid-70s, a few new wrinkles had been added to the program largely responsible for Sambo's early success. Fraction of the action now allowed managers to buy up to an additional 30% interest in 5% increments, hence Potentially, a manager could own up to 50% of the units under his control. Sambo's supervisory employees were now also allowed to participate in fraction of the action on some options. The area managers could also buy a percentage of all the units they controlled. Thus, 
They all had a reason to be successful as they had money riding on the outcome of operations of not only their units, but others as well. The menu was expanded as new items were added. Sambo's had become the premier restaurant chain managed by a great staff who were the best in the country at operating their units. The chain's success was bolstered by billboard advertising, merchandising, and effective television advertising, a sample of which follows. Sambo's has beefed up its menu with three delicious roast beef favorites and three great values. Your whole family will love Sambo's new roast beef dinner, complete with super salad, vegetable potato and roll, a French dip sandwich with potato salad or French fries or coleslaw, or a hot roast beef sandwich with all the trimmings, including super salad. So come on in for roast beef now at Sambo's. We beefed up our menu, and it's just what the family ordered. Remember when the quarter went a long way? These days, it doesn't even go a short way. Dad, haven't you heard of inflation? Here you go, sport. You must eat this more than I do. At Sambo's, a quarter still goes a long way. Every time an adult has dinner at Sambo's, a little adult also gets a meal. The Samburger Junior, a delicious double burger for just 25 cents. Hey, Dad, I'll pay my own way tonight. Sambo's, we're bringing down the high price of bringing up your kids. If you're as steamed up as Sambo's is about the high cost of eating out, come on into Sambo's and get a hot roast beef sandwich for $1.89. $1.89? Only $1.89 for tender slices of hot roast beef with potatoes steaming with rich brown gravy. If you're as steamed up about high prices as much as Sambo's is, we've got a hot roast beef sandwich for only $1.89. Only $1.89. Get it while it's hot. In September 1978, Sambo's opened its 1,000th store in Anaheim, California, adjacent to Disneyland. The company reached its peak in 1979 with 1,117 locations and over 60,000 employees. But there were dark clouds looming on the horizon as several problems began to surface, some internal and some external. Lawsuits, Securities and Exchange Commission rulings, name changes, and profit losses all collectively gathered to create a perfect storm that eventually caused the demise of the company. Sambo's name itself started to draw objections from the NAACP and civil rights leaders claiming the name to be racist. Town councils began to object to the restaurant with the racially charged name appearing in their town. The Sambo's name became a lightning rod for boycotts, protests, and lawsuits occurring in Virginia, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Ohio, and Michigan. In Rhode Island, the state's Human Rights Commission decided that, quote, the use of the name Sambo's had the effect of notifying black persons that they were unwelcome at Sambo's restaurants because of their race, end quote. The Urban League of Springfield, Massachusetts, insisted that the name, quote, carried racial overtones despite what Sambo's says, end quote. And this, after hearing objections from the NAACP, the Fairfax City Council voted last night to tell a na nationwide restaurant chain that the name Sambo's planned for a restaurant being built in the city is, quote, culturally offensive, end quote. The city of Toledo denied Sambo's the right to advertise in newspapers or on the air 
or even to put a placard inside the window of their restaurants. Suddenly, people who once hailed Sambo's as a great name now look down upon it as degrading. The courts generally sided with Sambo's under the banner of the First Amendment. But by then, Sambo's was starting to falter financially. The damage in the court of public opinion was done. In an attempt to stem the tide, units in the northeastern part of the United States opened under a different name, No Place Like Sam's. In other locations, the local community passed resolutions forbidding the use of the original name or refused to grant the chain permits. More name changes, the Jolly Tiger and Seasons Friendly Eating. In the South, Sambo's eventually decided to rechristen itself No Place Like Sam's. The plethora of name changes negatively influenced their corporate identity and affected customers' recognition and loyalty. The sad facts were, one, the name was derived from a combination of the two founders' names. Two, Sambo's was perhaps the most equal opportunity employer of the time. They hired a much higher percentage of blacks than most other companies and restaurants. Some blacks own their own units. Third, neither Battistone nor Bonnet had a racist bone in their bodies. They were just businessmen who seized on a branding opportunity and then wound up on the wrong side of history. The ownership program, fraction of the action that had worked so well, came into questioning by the Securities and Exchange Commission. They questioned how the corporation carried ownership of the manager percentages on their books. The company had been carrying them as full ownership leaving out the manager's percentages. The SEC did not go along with this and the company was put in the place of buying back from the managers the questionable shares. Sambo's accounting treated the initial $20,000 in such a way that it showed up as income for the parent company, despite a clause that gave Sambo's the right to buy back the interest at the purchase price if the manager retired or left the company. The SEC challenged the incentive program in 1977, arguing that the initial $20,000 payment was a deposit, not income. The company responded by restating its earnings downward for 20 years and devised a new incentive formula. This had a profound effect on the company. Sambo's was left no choice except to eliminate the program and profits were severely effective. This did not sit well with the managers and over the next few years, many left causing a 500% turnover of management. However, it was not the lawsuits, SEC rulings, name changes, or performance losses like $78 million in 1979, $12 million in 1980, and $29 million in 1981, singularly, but the sum of all of these factors which led to Sambo's filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in 1981. By 1984, all the remaining locations had been sold to Denny's, Baker's Square, Godfather's Pizza, Village Inn, and other interested buyers. And then they were all gone. Well, almost. There is one left, 
the original location at 216 West Cabrillo Boulevard, Santa Barbara, where it all began. For 15 years after the nationwide chain went under, the original location plodded along, churning out pancakes and coffee. Then, Chad Stevens, the grandson of Sam Battistone Sr., stepped in with a goal to, quote, resurrect something that my family had built, end quote. He decided to double down on the Sambo's brand. If you visit Sambo's today, you can order the Papa Jumbo, Mama Mumbo, Tiger Special, and view the walls adorned with vintage memorabilia. At the Hostess Cashier Counter, Sambo's merchandise is available for sale, just as it was over 60 years ago. When asked if he considered a name change for the restaurant, he said, at first I thought it would be a good idea to change the name, but I soon realized that nostalgia for the chain was a powerful thing and that the brand was too valuable to give up. Does anyone ever complain? We do get the occasional complaint and yet, for every complaint, there are about 1,000 people who say, wow, I can't believe it's still here, or open another one in our town. With an eye towards possibly opening another location, Stevens recently tried to trademark the Sambo's name. The state of California approved his request but Washington turned it down, considering it a derogatory term and therefore no trademark would be granted. So it is highly unlikely any new stores under that name will be open anytime soon. Recently, Stevens had a week long party celebrating Sambo's 60th anniversary and he rolled back the prices of pancakes to the original prices of the old menu, offering a stack of pancakes for 60 cents. If you missed the birthday bash and you want a great meal with ambiance, Sambo's is a very popular destination, so plan on a line at the door with a 30 minute wait. The innovative revolutionary program, Fraction of the Action, first developed and tested by Sambo's, was the impetus and the basis for the culture and compensation systems in place today. Many companies like KFC, Outback Steakhouse, and Golden Corral built off that original Sambo's model and improved it. Today, P.F. Chang's, Chick-fil-A, and Panera Bread are examples of companies that use systems like this. It has become a lasting legacy to the restaurant industry as incentive systems have become the norm today rather than the exception. The two founders of Sambo's, Sam and Bo, were very smart, kind, generous, giving, and forgiving men. When Newell Bennett retired, he moved his family from Santa Barbara to Oahu, Hawaii, where he established several restaurants. He owned businesses in Vermont and Arizona but his main passion was a 107,000 acre ranch, which he had purchased in 1972. Newell passed away in Arizona on New Year's Day, 2017 at age 93. He was buried in Kaneohe, Hawaii. 
Sam Battistone passed in Santa Barbara in 1992 at age 78 and is buried in the Santa Barbara Cemetery. He was a true gentleman whose handshake was law, a good-hearted man willing to hire anyone who did a good day's work for a day's pay. The man who gave America a good 10 cent cup of coffee gave generously to Santa Barbara many times over. In 1968, he established the Battistone Foundation to help seniors by providing quality low-income housing to retired citizens who were not as fortunate as he, thus leaving a lasting gift to the Santa Barbara community. While preparing this presentation, I realized Motel 6 and Sambo's share several characteristics and parallels. Each firm was founded in Santa Barbara by two local partners. Both companies are over 50 years old. Sambo's founded in the late 50s, Motel 6 in the early 60s. Each grew to over 1,100 locations, many picked jointly by the two companies. Each achieved sales in the billions. Each partnership had a member upon retirement purchase a large out-of-state ranch, and each of their original locations are going strong today, but only one had a happy ending. In 1960, William Becker traveled with his family on an extended road trip across the country from Santa Barbara to upstate New York. During the trip, the family experienced iffy room accommodations and varied fluctuating prices, giving him the idea for a budget motel chain. Upon his return, he called his friend, Paul Green, and proposed the idea to him. The two local men, Green, a building contractor, and Becker, a house painter, had worked together building low-cost housing developments. The men spent two years developing a plan to build motels with rooms at bargain rates, starting initially with $4 a night per room as their target price. After further research and number crunching, Green and Beckett settled on a $6 price per night. They estimated the $6 price would cover building costs, land leases, mortgages, management costs, maid service, and janitorial supplies, and of course, a profit. They named the motel from this $6 price, hence Motel 6. Their idea came to fruition in 1962 when the first Motel 6 opened near the beach at 443 Corona del Mar, Santa Barbara. It had 54 rooms designed with no frills. From the beginning, it branded itself as No Frills Lodging. The Santa Barbara location had no restaurant on site, a clear departure from other hotels of the era, though there were usually a choice of restaurants nearby. While Green and Becker were constructing their first budget motel, other larger operators were doing just the opposite. Motels such as Holiday Inn were creating increasingly luxurious properties, emulating hotels and therefore having to charge higher prices. Green and Decker designed nearly every aspect of their first Motel 6 to reduce costs wherever possible. Beds were built flush to the floor to shorten the time required to clean each room. Shower stalls were constructed with rounded edges to eliminate scrubbing in corners. Glasses were replaced with styrofoam cups. Sheets were wash and wear. 
dressers were eliminated. Television sets were outfitted with coin boxes that required a guest to deposit 25 cents for six hours of viewing. And advertising for the motel relied exclusively on billboard announcements. Rooms were designed and furnished to reduce the time it took to clean them. The partners started to expand and followed a model like McDonald's by ensuring that every customer could expect a set price and clean, comfortable rooms at every location. And expand they did. By 1965, they had built and were operating 14 locations in California, and they opened their first out-of-state location in Salt Lake City, Utah. The Motel 6 idea had become very popular and other chains began to imitate the concept. Realizing the need to move quickly, Becker and Green set out on an ambitious expansion program and opened 11 more locations with Gilroy, California, their 25th motel. Motel 6 stayed ahead of the competition by keeping construction costs at about 50% of other motel properties. The company generated more than $4 million in sales in 1966 and earned profits of more than $750,000, double the results of the previous year. Green and Becker had now moved into Utah, Nevada, Arizona, and Iowa, and were awaiting completion of a 12-story motel in Waikiki. Motel 6 had clearly caught the motel industry by storm with its rapid growth. With an occupancy rate of about 85%, which was well above the industry average of 67%, Motel 6 became an attractive acquisition target. In 1968, Motel 6 was sold by partners Green and Becker and acquired by City Investment Company, giving the company the financial wherewithal to expand at an even more robust pace. They received $14 million. That's $84 million in today's dollars for the 180 motels they had owned. Not a bad return for the pioneers of the revolutionary concept that all had thought was an impossible idea. They accomplished their dream by paying tireless attention to construction costs and design planning. Thereafter, Motel 6 was sold several times. In 1990, the company was bought by the French-based Accor for $1.3 billion, and in 2012, the Blackstone Group purchased the 1,102 locations for $1.9 billion. Today, the original Motel 6 in Santa Barbara is still going strong. Though the outside is standard issue Motel 6 architecture, inside there's now a bit of personality and pop to the decor, right down to the bright orange prints on the bed. If you plan to stay there, reservations are recommended well in advance. As for Becker and Green, they continued to work with the company before retiring in 1973. Paul Green quietly passed away in 1994 at age 80. William Becker left Santa Barbara in 1978 to ranch a large cattle operation in Arizona. In 1980, the former house painter and Motel 6 founder started the Stockman's Bank in Kingman, which had 43 branches in Arizona and California by the time he retired as chairman. He died April 2, 2007, at his ranch outside Kingman. He was 85 years old. 
And of course, we could not finish our Motel 6 story without mentioning the homey, iconic voice and monologue of Tom Bedette, whose ads endeared millions towards Motel 6. Tom and the Motel 6 advertising agency had earned dozens of prestigious awards, including the 2017 Radio Mercury Awards top prize. The Richards Group Advertising Agency was hired by Motel 6 in 1985 and thought Bedette would be an excellent spokesman for the chain because of his warm and friendly vocal style. Hired in 1986, Bedette ad-libbed the line, we'll leave the light on for you, while in the recording studio for the first time and the slogan was both an instant and lasting success, staying with the chain for over 25 years and counting. Hi, Tom Bodette here. If you say cheese when someone takes your picture, it looks like you're smiling. If you say frugal, it makes it look like you just ate a mouthful of spicy walnuts. Well, say no more. Just know Motel 6 is a clean, comfortable room for the lowest price of any national chain. That's better than any mouthful of spicy walnuts. Book online at motel6.com. I'm Tom Bodette for Motel 6, and we'll leave the light on for you. So, until our next presentation, we'll leave the light on for you.